All right. So what we're going to do is start talking about variations. Quick question. So you guys on my screen, you see all of you together there, correct? I guess seeing Chris, Sean, stuff. Yeah. Did that go away? Can you, you, can you still, you still see, are you, are you guys still seeing sort of the list of video down the side? Uh, for me, it's like at the top of the screen and I can see five people. Okay. So are you seeing five people there? Yes. Right. Uh, and what if I do that? Can you still see them? Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, I just, I, I guess, you know, cause our video screen kind of, pulls me off of it's taking up space on this so I was just trying to figure out if that I think you can actually use the view option for side by side and you can see ah that's all right we'll just do that that looks good I like that cool all right so uh Today we're going to go through, talk about uh, real quickly, different types of regression, sort of basically different approaches to aggression or to a regression. Most of this uh, is, there's some things that uh, will be uh, different, uh, but the main ones that we're going to use in psychological science are pretty much uh, going to be similar uh, or simultaneous regression. And our hierarchical regressions, we'll talk about stepwise regression a little bit. We don't see that used a whole lot in psychological sciences for reasons that we'll talk about. But just want to get you uh, uh, a good understanding of um, kind of what's going on with these different types of models. Um, the worksheet uh, that I was posted to Wild Courses is a simultaneous and hierarchical regression sheet. Uh, this is the one I went through and did. Um, like a, a walkthrough in SPSS and Stata, uh, we're going to go through sort of basic these basic these basic tables in the lecture today. But if you're wanting a, a tutorial on how to what options to select in SPSS and stuff like that, uh, that video is going to be a good reference uh, uh, for for that material. Okay, so uh, all right. So the first type of uh, model, and this is the one we've kind of been working on uh, to this point. You hear it uh, heard of, or referred to as simultaneous regression, standard multiple regression, um, sort of some of those names. And so the idea here with the standard multiple regression or simultaneous regression, what we're doing is we're taking all of our explanatory variables, all of our independent variables, our predictors, whatever you want to call them, are going to be loaded into our uh, model simultaneously. Okay, so all of the models go, or all of the variables go in, and what we're looking at with this in our final in our table, what it's going to give us is a, a set of coefficients that are uh, representing the unique association of the predictor with the outcome. Okay, so Chris, see what when I when I'm talking about why am I why am I making a big deal about this being a, a unique association of the predictor with the outcome? are uniquely responsible for the outcome. Exactly, right? So with our simultaneous multiple regression, and this is important, people get confused about this. Um, the only part that goes into your regression coefficient is the unique association between that predictor and your outcome, controlling for everything else in the model, okay? So Sean, what happens uh, because we know, particularly in, in psychological science, a lot of times uh, we have multiple predictors that share the same sort of portion of variability with our outcome. Where does where does that predictive uh, v uh, variability get sent to? Do you remember? I guess I'm not quite following your question. Okay. So, so we've got... Uh, an associate, X1 is associated with Y, X2 is associated with Y, but X1 and X2 are correlated with one another. And so X1, X2, and Y all share 
kind of common variants. Where do where does what part of our model is, does captures that? So so one x one x will capture both the shared with x two and uh, and it's it's independent and x two will have its own that's just that is not shared. Right. Okay. And so this and this is where where the 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 con some confusion often happens with different forms of of regression anybody uh jump in and tell me sort of so we've got variability that's unique to x1 with y variability that's unique to, uh with x2 with y and then there's going to be shared variance that's all common between x1 x2 and y so if the unique stuff from x1 and x2 with y get sent to their respective coefficients. What about the shared stuff? Where where does that get captured in our model? Are you talking about the grand mean? In like the alpha? The A? Uh not what do what do we what do we call this in a in our regression model? Yeah, yeah. So basic basically what this is getting is is our R squared value. Okay. So when we're when we're thinking about our regression models, right, our individual coefficients, our individual predictors, these are rep representing the unique association of each one of our predictors with our outcome, right? But anything that's shared, anything that's common across our predictors, the individual coefficients don't get credit for that, but our overall model does, right? So that R squared value, like that's what's getting sort of capturing and sucking up all that shared variability. OK, and so when we're thinking about this, because we can have correlations between our individual predictors, it's possible and it all sometimes happens. And it does happen in this example where we have uh, a nice bivariate correlation between a predictor and an outcome. But when we put it in the model, the actual coefficient for that, the unique predictive value of that uh, individual variable is negligent to non-existent. Right. So tomorrow, what's what? Can you help us understand what's happening with that situation? So in the case where we have two um, predictors, you said that are that have a wide um, a correlation that mm -hmm. are correlated, but they're not showing up as um, like significant in our regression. Yeah. So I've got I've got uh, a predictor that has a strong correlation with my outcome. But when I put that predictor in my regression model with a bunch of other predictors, I find that that predictor, even though it has a strong bivariate relation with my outcome, it's no longer a meaningful predictor within the context of my regression. How do we, how do we account for that? Um, it could be due to like shared variance with other yeah. predictors. So it's kind of taking away from um, the regression and then it would be captured in R squared Exactly. So we can have situations, right, where I have, say, four different predictors, right, that all have very strong correlations with my outcome, right? But when I put all four of those correlations or all four of those predictors into my regression model, what I could find, mathematically, this could be a possibility that I have my model is doing a very good job of predicting my outcome, right? I have a very strong R squared, suggesting that the best linear combination of predictors in uh, that I have in my model is doing a tremendous job in predicting variability in my outcome. But if I go down through and I look at my individual coefficients for my individual predictors, all of those are functionally zero, right? So what's, what's, what, what would that suggest is going on in my model, CJ? Uh, there's a lot of shared variance. Yeah, right. Basically, what I would suspect is I've got a problem with collinearity. Okay, I've got I've got my four predictors all individually correlate strongly with my outcome and my model is uh, has a very strong R squared. But individually, none of these predictors are coming up as reliable. My guess is that all those predictors are basically uh, measuring the same thing. Sean and I had a discussion uh, over email about this, right? I've got four predictors that are all basically measuring the same thing. And so all of the variability that they share with outcome is all shared with each other. And so my R squared is quite large, 
but none of those individual predictors are popping up as contributing anything unique or significant or new. No one's bringing anything. Everybody brought chips to the party. Party's cool because there's a lot of chips, but no one brought anything new or unique, so no one gets credit for stuff. Okay. So again, when we're going through and we're looking at these simultaneous regression models, important uh, to go through and not only uh, take a look at our regression coefficients, but also go through and take a look at our, our bivariate correlations to see kind of where these changes are going on and where, where things are happening. Okay. Um, so questions about kind of what's going on with these models. Okay. Uh, and so what we're doing with our simultaneous regression, we're looking at an interest in the unique contribution of our individual predictors with our outcome uh, while controlling for everything else in the model. Okay. Um, quick note on our simultaneous regression, regression models in general. Um, when we're looking at... Uh, oh my, uh, Alicia, what is the difference between my unstandardized coefficients and my standardized coefficients in these models? You're changing the way that you're interpreting the coefficients? Yep. In, the, uh, co the interpretation is different. Chris, can you, Chris M., can you add to that? Uh, one unit change in the predictor accounts for one standard deviation change in the outcome variable. Okay. And what, what uh, coefficient is that? Okay, close. Yeah. So a, a unit change or a standard deviation change in our predictor, if we're talking about our standardized coefficients, a standard deviation change in my predictor corresponds to a standard deviation unit change in my outcome. Okay. Uh, with my, and how does that relate? What's, what's the specific interpretation of my unstandardized coefficient? Right. So uh, we've got two different coefficients, right? We've got our, our unstandardized coefficient, and this is just working with raw metrics. So we uh, a unit change in X uh, uh, court rel relative to the expected unit change in Y. Uh, if we're talking about our standardized coefficients, however, our units are now standard deviations, right? Because we've turned everything into Z scores. So uh, we would interpret a uh, literal interpretation of our standardized coefficient is expected uh, standard deviation change in Y given a standard deviation change in X. Okay. Now, uh, Ignacio, what, what, what is the benefit of our standardized coefficients? Like what, why are these helpful and useful? Yeah, right. Exactly. That's a, you're exactly right. So, uh, my variables, my individual variables are going to have a whole, they're going to, the scaling's all super different, right? So, a unit change in one variable might be a huge change, whereas a unit change in another one might be trivial, right? If I have one predictor that's ranged uh, uh, zero to five on a true continuous scale, and I've got another one that's zero to 100, a one unit change in that zero to 100 scale is minute, right? Uh, the one unit change in the zero to five scale is quite a bit bigger, right? So uh, the problem with our unstandardized coefficients, we can't look at an unstandardized coefficient and tell anything about the magnitude of the relation, right? But we can, within a, a, a regression model, we can look at those standardized coefficients and start comparing and looking across my predictors, which one of these is relatively larger in terms of strength and contribution and things like that, right? So that's the nice thing about our standardized coefficients. But if I'm looking across studies, okay, so Nick has done a study, right? And he's reported uh, uh, standardized coefficients. And Alicia runs a replication, right? Same variables and same measures and things like that. 
if I'm comparing those two models, I should be, I need to be looking at comparing the unstandardized coefficients as opposed to the standardized coefficients. Okay, it's inappropriate to compare standardized coefficients across different studies. Okay, and the problem is, is that uh, when we compute our standardized coefficients, what we're doing is we're taking all our, uh, our outcomes, uh, our out outcome in our predictor, and turning it into z-scores, right? And so we're taking uh, z-scores, we're taking the individual's uh, scores minus the sample mean divided by the standard deviation, right? But if Nick's study, his variable for x has a much larger standard deviation than Alicia's study, now all of a sudden those coefficients are going to look different based on levels of standard deviation or variability within the set, right? And we can't really capture or know that type of thing, right? So what we're going to do, because samples, if they have unequal variances, uh, those, uh, those uh, standardized coefficients are no longer reasonable metrics to be comparing across studies. So when we're thinking about our regression tables, within the context of our regression model, our standardized coefficients are nice in terms of weighing out relative importance or contribution of predictors. But if I'm comparing across studies, what we should be looking at uh, is looking at the unstandardized coefficients if I want to compare back and forth. Does this make some sense? Okay. Uh, and again, if everybody had the same, uh, had roughly the same standard deviations for all their predictors and outcomes uh, across the two studies, then uh, standardized coefficients would be comparable. But if they're not, you could say, oh, this looks a lot stronger uh, uh, effect than something else, but it's just really because the variability differs across the two samples and sort of starts to change that around. Okay. Questions? All right, cool. So uh, for a simultaneous regression, uh, again, we're going to use the same uh, data that we were using for our screener. Uh, so we've got a couple different questions. Uh, first question, do, sim do PTSD symptoms, pain, and opiate use account for meaningful variability in role functioning among motor vehicle accident survivors? Okay. Um, Chris C., what is, for question one, what statistic is answering this question? Um, what do you mean by what statistic? Like, what's our dependent variable? Or no, no, no. Like in my in my regression outcome. So, my, or my regression gives me a bunch of stuff. Oh. If my question is, do do PTSD say let's, what does the best combination of oh. linear combination of PTSD, pain severity, and opiate use count for meaningful variability in role functioning? What so, what? So, Yeah. Uh, is that just going to be your R? Absolutely. This is just going to be a question about my model. This is asking about the predictive qualities of my model. So if what I'm interested in is does this set of variables predict variability of my outcome, that's a model-based question, right? That's uh, uh, We're going to answer that with our R squared and our F test with the ANOVA table and things like that, okay? Uh, but if I'm interested in the unique relation of PTSD, pain, and opiate use with role functioning, following motor vehicle accidents. Chris, what uh, what are we looking for there? It's like your individual uh, correlations between the 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 um, the independent variable and the the outcome, the predictor and the outcome. Yep. So my individual regression coefficients here, not the correlations, but the individual coefficients. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So here we've got our PTSD, our pain variable, opiate use, and then because we uh, recognized role functioning is garbage, we went through and ran a log transform of that. Okay. Um, and so this is if we were going to go through, we go analyze regression, linear statistics, confidence intervals, part and partial correlations. This is how we would request that in SPSS. Okay. Uh, but if we do, this is what we get in terms of our output. Um, uh, and Sean, tell me up here in this model summary, what am I getting in, in that table there? Uh, you're getting model fit. So R is uh, R squared, how well the uh, predictors uh, predict Y. And then the adjusted is based on how many predictors we have in the, in the model. Yeah, it's a downward adjust, adjustment for inflation. So can you give me a literal interpretation of that R squared value right there? 
so 38% of the variability in mean y is accounted for by the indexes. Yeah, perfect. So the best linear combination of my predictors accounts for about 38.1% of the variability in y in these data. Okay, uh, so our r squared is a is a a nice descriptive statistic for the the data that we're working with. Um, and someone, Nick, can you tell me what this adjusted r square is doing? So uh, our r squared value is positively uh, biased, so it's just a downward adjustment on that to make it a little less biased. Yeah. And so uh, that R squared value is going to be better. If you're interested in uh, reporting a population based uh, estimate for the extent to which this set of predictors uh, accounts for stuff in your outcome, your adjusted R squared is going to be uh, um, the best uh, option there. In psychology, we don't get too worried about this for the most part because we're rarely trying to maximize our R squared values. We're generally testing theory and things like that. And so this is generally not the biggest thing that we're focused on, but in other areas it might be, right? If I'm in a straight up applied, like uh, um, uh, working in industry and wanting to sort of maximize, maximize predictive value, this starts to become very important, okay? Um, and that adjusted R square is gonna, you see shifts based on number of, uh, number of predictors, sample size, and things along those lines in terms of the adjustment there, okay? Um, all right, Siley, uh, this ANOVA table here, what is what is this giving us? It's giving you the strength of the actual, it's your omnibus test? Yep. Model. Perfect, yeah. This is just a test of my R squared value, right? Literally, this F test is asking whether or not we have evidence against the null hypothesis that that R squared value is equal to zero, right? Uh, and Siley, what do we see within this table? Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems that it's not compatible with the null hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. We have very strong evidence against that. Uh, the shared ver the, against uh, the null hypothesis of zero shared variability of opiate use, pain, and uh, PTSD in this measure of role functioning. Right. So this will start to become a more important in knowing kind of what these are when we start to get into the hierarchical models, okay? So this is our ANOVA table, which is a test of our R squared. R squared is telling us the proportion of variability in our outcome that's being accounted by, for by the combination of our predictors. Uh, and then down here uh, at the bottom, we get our coefficient table. Um, and someone tell me, Nick, Tell me what this constant value is. So the constant is just if all of your predictors, um, those values were at zero. Yep. That the constant, that's the, the value that would uh, predict the outcome. Yep. So uh, our constant is just our expected value of our outcome when all of our predictors are equal to zero. And if we look at our, uh, our model equation, that's pretty easy to see. If I put in zero for pain, zero for opiate use, zero for PTSD, all that gets taken away. Only thing that's left over is just this constant, right? And so uh, my constant is telling me my expected value of, of the natural log of role functioning when everything else is held constant at zero, okay? Uh, and then this test here is just saying, is my coefficient, is my est uh, estimate of my coefficient different than zero? Yeah, very clearly it is, but this isn't often something we're too concerned about in uh, in our research, although it can come up as important, and we'll go through examples. Um, and then what about, Sean, uh, these coefficients here for opiate use, uh, pain, and PTSD? So for, a, I guess for opiate use, you're saying, uh, I guess I forget which one of the reference is, but... Um, if uh, you use opiate use versus not, it breaks it into two groups. One group is lower by 0 0.039. Yeah, perfect. And zero is going to be in this data coded no. One is going to be yes, right, which is always sort of something important to go through. So literally, because opiate use is a, bi is a dichotomous variable, 
This coefficient is literally telling me the expected difference between groups uh, controlling for all other variables in the model. Okay, You can talk about this as a, a one unit change in opiate use is associated with a point, negative 0.039 uh, decrease in the natural log of role functioning. That's kind of a ridiculous way to interpret it, right? Because a one use, unit increase in opiate use just means the difference between people who don't use and who do use, right? So it's not a change in opiate use. It's, it's literally talking about a, a grouped level difference when we're controlling for other variables in the model, okay? Um, and then, Sean, you're on a roll, man. Uh, what about this pain severity score? So pain severity is um, for a unit increase in the pain severity score, your, um, your reply would move negatively by 0.685. Yeah, perfect. PSD yeah. Score. And what type of and what coefficients are we interpreting here? Our estimators. Yeah. What types of coefficients? Um, not standardized. Yep. These are our unstandardized coefficients, right? So literally, for every unit change in our our uh, continuous predictor, expected uh, corresponding change in y, except when we're working in with our dichotomous variables. I mean, the interpretation still holds. But literally what we're talking about is the expected difference between our two groups um, controlling for all of the variables in the model. Okay, So here's our unstandardized predictors. Here's our standard errors. And if we take our standard our coefficients divided by our standard error, it's going to give us our t-statistic, which we're then testing on uh, our residual degrees of freedom, so uh, our degrees of freedom error, so 197. So literally if I take uh, negative... 0.685 divided by 0.073. I'm going to get a t-statistic of negative 9.39. And I'm going to compare that against a critical value for t with 197 degrees of freedom. And that's going to give me this incredibly small uh, p-value here. Okay. Um, here's going to be our, our confidence intervals. We interpret these just like we normally do any other confidence interval here. I would say my best guess the unstandardized coefficient or for the unique effect of pain severity on the natural log of role functioning is going to be 0.685. But these data are going to be compatible with uh, population estimates ranging from negative 0.83 to point, negative 0.54, right? So this is just giving us our level of uncertainty, okay? Last thing we've got here is I requested part and partial correlations. And um, uh, Chris M., what are what are these zero order correlations here? Is it the uh, degree to which the these individual variables are correlated with the outcome variable? Yep, these are just standard Pearson correlations. These are just our bivariate correlations. Zero order correlations are just our bivariate correlations, right? So I can see that I've got uh, small correlations of opiate use and pain with our outcome and then a pretty strong correlation of pain severity with the natural log of role functioning, okay? Um, CJ, help me understand these partial correlations. What's going on there? I'm not sure. Any, anybody, anybody have an idea on partial correlations? Beautiful. You know, that's a virtual high five, Nick, because you're exactly right. Um, what we're looking at is our bivariate or zero order correlation. These are our bivariate correlations, okay? But our partial correlations is saying once I take out all the variability that's attributable to other predictors in the model, of what's left over, what's unique to, or uh, what is uh, shared with uh, my outcome or my predictor here. Okay, um, and so we see here that opiate use has a eh, it has a small correlation with the natural log of role functioning, right? If I'm just looking at those two together, okay. Um, but CJ, what happens when I go from the zero order correlation to my partial correlation? 
it, it decreases quite a bit. And why why is that? How do we understand that? Zero order is taken out for the partial. Yeah, right. And so if we look at this, and so what we would do is we could square these cor these partial correlations uh, and then uh, literally interpret them as a proportion of variability attributable uh, uh, to the residual or the portion of residual variability that's uh, shared with the uh, outcome. So if I go 0 0.014 and square that, I get 0 0.0002. Okay, so two one hundredths of a percent of the residual variability left over in the natural log of role functioning after I pull out pain severity and PTSD is shared with opiate use. Okay, what this is telling us is that all the variability uh, that was shared with uh, between opiate use and uh, the natural log of role functioning also completely overlaps with uh, shared variability with pain and PTSD. And once we take out the variability uh, that's shared with pain or the variability that's attributable to the combination of pain and PTSD, what's left over, our residual variability, is functionally unrelated to opiate use. Opiate use doesn't make any difference at that point in time. Okay. And so uh, what we're looking at here is just like a for sure literal partial correlation. And so if I were to go through and let's say we'll look at the partial correlation here for pain severity is 0.556 and I square that I get a value of 0.309 right so what I would do is I could interpret this as saying um, uh, pain severity accounts for roughly 30.9 percent of the residual variability in the natural log of role functioning when controlling for opiate use and PTSD okay so once we take variability that's attributable opiate use and PTSD and pull that out of the model, about 30% of what's left over is shared with, with pain severity. Okay. So um, our partial, uh, our zero order correlations, we can square those and that's just between the two sort of shared variability there. Partial correlations, we can square those and talk about uh, the proportion of residual variability in our outcome controlling for other predictors in the model uh, that's shared with our outcome. But that's kind of a weird thing to talk about, right? It's sort of the same thing when we got a partial eta squared. Um, and so our partial correlations, particularly when we square them, don't have a lot of intuitive value to them. It's hard to sort of kind of wrap your head around. But the nice thing about your partial correlations is they correspond to standardized benchmarks for small, medium, large, things along those lines, right? Uh, and so we'll present those when we get into moderation stuff. So your partial correlations are a nice benchmark for uh, effect size for your individual predictors, okay? Now, what about these part correlations? Can someone tell me what's going on with the part correlation? What do we call these? What is what is part correlation? What is that? Uh, what is that SPSS talk for? Um, I was just gonna say it stands for um, semi-partial, and it's interpreted like the exact same as the one that says partial, except it's um, you're not talking about residual variability. It's just the uh, proportion of variability. Yep. Yep. And so if our if we were to square our partial correlation, if this is the proportion of residual variability shared with a predictor, our part correlation, this is the total variability. So if I go through and I take uh, my semi-partial correlation uh, between pain severity and PTSD, or pain severity and role function is 0.526. Uh, and I square that, I'm going to get a value of 0.277 right and i can interpret that as saying 27 27.7 close to 28% of the total variability in the natural log of role functioning is uniquely attributable to pain severity okay and what i like about semi partial correlations when we square these is they're more intuitive right of the total piece of the pie over a quarter of that variability is uniquely attributable to pain severity once we control for other stuff 
Okay, that starts to make more sense to me. Uh, the partial correlations are important for effect size and and uh, and uh, power analyses and things like that. But what we're talking about there is the so what did I say? This was thirty percent. Let's say. So 30% of the residual variability in the natural log of role functioning, controlling for opiate use and PTSD is attributable to pain. Okay, but if I say uh, over uh, about 28% of the total variability in the outcome is uniquely attributable to pain, that kind of makes more sense to me. Or it's easier to like wrap my head around. Does that make some sense? Okay. So, I'm still a little bit confused. Okay. Uh, Variability. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I'm still confused. Then why? Why is the semi-partial smaller? Is something I'm understanding. Yeah. Yeah. So let me let me see. And this, and you know what? And I've got on order a slick writing pad that's should be coming up here. Oh no! I don't want to do that. Uh, okay, let me do this. Here we go. Paint. All right. So let's say um, that's the total piece of my pie. That's all the variability in my outcome, right? Um, and this is the total variability in Y that I'm wanting to account for, okay? Um, my bivariate correlation is just going to give me that. You guys are impressed with my drawing skills, right? Okay, there we go, right? Uh, and so this is X1. Oh, this is good. This is like art class. X2. All right, so... Uh, if I'm talking about uh, my bivariate correlations, right? Uh, oh, where are you at, CJ? Uh, CJ, uh, what? Mm, here we'll do this, and then we'll do this, and then we'll do that okay cool so if i'm talking about shared variability between x1 and y right what what colors are capturing that shared variability between x1 and y it's all the well you're asking the colorblind guy here but oh are you colorblind ah <laughs> crepes color, i can tell you it's probably red or green i don't know which oh yeah i put the red and the green right <laughs> oh Fail. All right, here, how about this? We'll do this. Uh, we'll go. Uh, it's, just, it's just red and green that's the, uh, the problem here. <laughs> well, you got, I got red and green and blue here. So here, let's go A, B, C, and then we'll call this D. Okay, there we go. So uh, shared variability between uh, X1 and Y. What What regions are being covered there? A and C, right? And for X2 and Y in the bivariate relation, B and C, right? Um, now, if I'm thinking about my semi-partial correlation, what's being captured, what region's being captured in my semi-partial correlation? Yep. A over what? Uh, uh, B. B. So, and, and so what, what proportion of variability in my outcome is being captured by my semi partial? Uh, Anybody want to help out? Plus, yeah, yeah, A 
plus b plus c plus d right and so this is what's nice about this squared semi-partial correlations it's telling me of the total variability in y what's unique to x1 right and that's just this piece right here okay but uh my partial correlation right Partial correlation, what's my partial correlation for X1 capturing tomorrow? Oh, go for it, CJ. A over what regions? Okay, so remember that my uh, I'm interpreting my squared partial correlation as the proportion of residual variability in my outcome attributable to, uh, to my predictor. And so if X1 is my predictor, what's, what portions, what, what's, what's the residual variability? What's left over after I account for X2 and anything that's shared with X2? Uh, D and what? A. A. Yeah. So, and I mean, these Venn diagrams, I feel like are the best way to kind of think about what's going on with this is because my, uh, my and, and important conceptual distinctions between the squares, uh, my partial and my semi-partial, right? My semi-partial is nice intuitively because it says of the total piece of the pie, of the, of the total pie, what's unique to my predictor, right? Um, so of the total variability in my outcome, I'm saying that this predictor is accounting for 25% of it, right? And so that's kind of nice and meaningful. Uh, my partial is a little bit harder, right? Because it's talking about residual variability. So after I pull out everything that's attributable to the rest of the model of what's left over, how much of that is shared with my outcome, right? And so this is why what we'll typically find uh, if we go through and take a look is that my partial will generally will almost always be larger than my semi-partial. Why is that? Yeah, yeah. My denominator is smaller, right? Uh, so unless, um, unless my uh, variables are completely uncorrelated, right? Um, what I'm typically going to find is because my semi-partial is looking at my total piece of the pie and my partial correlation is just what's left over after I pull everything out. So unless I've got predictors in the, like all other predictors in my model literally have zero association with my outcome, my semi-partial is always going to be, uh, generally going to be smaller than my, than my partial correlation. Okay. Um, and then, uh, between my bivariate uh, correlation and my partial correlation, um, which one of those is going to be smaller? The partial correlation, right? Unless my uh, variables, uh, my predictors are completely uncorrelated, right? So instead, so what I've got is I've got this and I've got this and I've got this, right? Um, and here's x1 and x2 and y here, okay? Uh, and I say my semi-partial correlation is 0 0.30. What's my bivariate correlation? 0 0.30, it's the same thing, right? Um, because my semi or my semi partial is looking at uh, share uh, unique variability, right? But if there's nothing overlapping between x1 and x2, then then I'm good to go with this. Okay. CJ, thank you for because this this is an important thing. Whenever we're talking about uh, these regression models and talking about partial correlation or partial partial coefficients and where this stuff starts to uh, where things feed in, all this starts to become super, super important. So uh, anybody else, any other questions that people have about interpreting our 
partial correlation or semi-partial correlation, so on and so forth. Feeling good about this? It's my outstanding notepad drawing. I think we've got old school. I just brought out Microsoft Notepad. <laughs> All right. Cool. All right. So questions on any of the stuff that we've got here uh, in this table. All right. Um, so again, when we go through and we take a look here and compare with our correlation tables, we'll see that my uh, bivariate correlations between role functioning, opiate use, pain, and PTSD, those are being laid out here, right? Uh, and I see that my standardized coefficients are systematically smaller than my bivariate correlations. Tomorrow, why is that? Well, not not for these because these are all this is all part of the the correlations in the and my standardized coefficients are all part of the are the same data set, right? Uh, but why am I seeing my standardized coefficients for my individual predictors being systematically smaller than my bivariate correlations? Oh, because the bivariate are just looking at the relationship between like those two and then the coefficients might have the like shared variance. Yeah, yeah. Within this table, each one of these coefficients, these are all, it doesn't matter if we're talking about the unstandardized or the standardized, this is just looking at the unique effect of X on Y controlling for other variables in the model, right? And if I've got correlations between my predictors, which I do down here, right? Correlation between pain, opiate use, pain, PTSD, PTSD, opiate use. We see that we've got correlated predictors, right? And so unless these values are literally zero, uh, you're going to probably see differences where these tend to be stronger than these. Now, there are cases when we might not see that. There are cases where we start to see standardized coefficients start to be larger or of opposite signs than our bivariate correlations. Does anybody know what that's called or an indication of? Yeah. Yeah. They're like competing with each other. Yeah. Increasing. What we'll hear has anybody heard of uh of suppression effects? Okay. This is what's happening, right? When I've got X is related to Y in some direction, but when I put it within the context in multivariate space in a regression model, now all of a sudden my coefficient is much larger than the bivariate relation or in the opposite direction of the bivariate relation, suggests that there's something strange going on in the sort of teasing teasing things apart um, and so it's always inter should always be comparing your standardized coefficients and things in this table your bivariate correlations to see if there's anything uh, up or interesting or peculiar going on with that stuff the suppression effects are a pain in the ass um, and they're really difficult to interpret and sort of draw conclusions on what's going on but they are something that come up on a not unregular bit uh, uh, on a semi-regular basis, so something to take a look at. And Tabachnik and Vidal have a really terrible description of sort of what's going on, but it's worth taking a look at. Okay. All right. Um, this is just uh, our regression models and stata. Again, same thing. Uh, Alicia, this is your, just your regression statement. Easy peasy. Uh, PCOR with the same variable list. This is going to give you your partial correlations, semi-partial correlations. And then state is going to go ahead and square those for you, just so you have those available uh, for you, which is nice. Um, and then PW core, PW core, this is just giving you bivariate correlations. This sig at the end is just giving you significance value or p values. So same type of stuff, just format looks a little bit different. Okay. All right. Uh, quick interpretation with our natural log uh, transform. So for these data, remember we went through the screening and we found that we had some pretty terrible skew with uh, our role functioning variable and so what we did is we went through and implemented a natural log transform and uh, someone had asked me why did we choose Siley I think it might have been you 
why did we choose the natural log transform versus sort of any other number of things we could use? Uh, the reason that uh, if we need to transform for skew, that the natural log is kind of nice, is because it retains uh, some interpretive properties. Uh, and those interpretive properties are dependent on what combination of X and Y is being, is being transformed. Okay, So if I transform a predict or my outcome, as we did in this set, right? So I log transform my outcome, and then I regress, regress the log transform of my outcome onto my predictors. What I can then do, I still have a transform variable, but if I've used the log transform, what I can do is though my uh, uh, unstandardized coefficients, I now interpret those where normally we would say a unit change in X associated with unit change in Y, right? Uh, but if I log transform, my outcome, I can now incorporate or interpret my standardized coefficients as, uh, or my unstandardized coefficients as reflecting the percentage, expected percent change in Y given a unit change in X. Okay. So for, uh, if I were to find uh, an effect or an unstandardized coefficient of negative 0.69 in my outcome, where I've uh, applied a natural log transform to my role functioning variable, I could interpret this value as indicating uh, that we're expecting a 69% decrease in role functioning given a unit increase in pain severity score. This is really, really nice because it still gives us some interpretive value. If I take the square uh, root transform of role functioning, then I'm just saying, uh, and if this is my uh, coefficient, I'm saying, well, a one unit increase in pain is going to uh, result in a 0 0.69, 0 0.69 decrease in the square root transform of role functioning. Well, I don't know what the square root transform of role functioning means. That's not a real value that has any conceptual meaning. But percent decrease in my role functioning variable, that makes some sense to me, right? People see what we're doing here and sort of why that's helped with some interpretive properties. Okay. Josh, is yeah. That true? Is that true whether you put the plus one or not? In that transform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the, 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 the additive, that just, that just switches the scale. That doesn't change anything. We're talking about uh, percentage increase, percentage decrease. So the constant doesn't matter. You could add a constant of 100 to it, and it's going to, the interpretation will remain the same. Okay. Cool. Okay. So that's if we transform our outcome. If we transform our IV, let's say instead we had a predictor that had a bad skew, right? And so we had decided to apply a log transform to the predictor, but our outcome was still in the raw value. Uh, same type of thing, but what we can now do is incorporate or uh, interpret that uh, unstandardized coefficient as uh, a 1% change associated with a uh, whatever my coefficient is over 100 uh uh, change in my uh, outcome, right? So here, if I had natural log, uh, applied a natural log transform of pain, right? So my predictor is transformed, but my outcome is not. What I could do is I would then say my coefficient here, um, I like that. You know what I just did? I just laser pointed my screen at home so you guys can see. Because <laughs> I'm because I'm three and I have yet to develop perspective taking, right? Um, if we go through uh, and we've got a coefficient of negative uh, 45.44, right? I would interpret this as a, as indicating a 1% increase in pain severity associated with a 0.45 unit decrease in role functioning, okay? So we're still retaining some of that interpretive properties. And if I transform both of them with a natural log function, if I have a natural log transform of my predictor and a natural log transform of my outcome, what I can do is now that changes that into uh, interpreting my unstandardized coefficient as a 1% change in X associated with a percent change in Y. So I've got uh, role functioning, trans natural, log, natural log transformed. I've got my predictor is a natural log transform. And in this scenario, my... Uh, coefficient is negative uh, 2.77, I would interpret this as an expected 2.77% uh, decrease in role functioning given a 1% uh, increase in pain severity.
Okay, so this is the really slick reason why, um, you know, not wanting to transform willy nilly. If I don't need to transform things, let's not transform things because it's going to start to make things look weird. You know, unless I'm working in again and sort of Nick comes up as the example just because the area he uses, right? Like the looking substance use, that's variables that are often pretty heavily skewed. And so people will generally log transform or transform those. And so that's not anything strange. But if you do need to transform, the natural log transform is nice because I can still interpret, give a literal interpretation of my coefficients in something that's meaningful. I'm just kind of, depending on the combination, I'm now talking about these as percentage change as opposed to unit change. Okay. Questions on any of this? Okay. Oh, and then those are just my coefficients for these, right? So here, but we already kind of went through. So uh, if we're going to go through and take a look at, uh, because uh, I've not transformed PTSD, right? But I have transformed my outcome variable. And so what I would do with this is I would say for every unit increase in PTSD, I'm expecting a 1.3% decrease in uh, role functioning. People see that? Okay. And that might not seem like a whole lot, but remember my PTSD scale goes from zero to 130 something, right? So one unit change isn't that much, right? Uh, but if I start adding on, right, if I were to go a standard deviation unit change, then that starts to increase, decrease things along those lines. Okay. Um, and here, uh, you could interpret this as a percentage difference uh, in role functioning across people using opiates and not using opiates, but we have absolutely next to zero evidence of any unique effect of opiate use on role functioning in this model. So it doesn't make sense to provide any sort of practical interpretation of this other than it, we don't have evidence of an effect. Okay. Questions? Okay, cool. All right, uh, let's go through, take a break. Let's take five. Um, uh, so try and be back by before 320, um, and we'll jump into hierarchical regression. Cool. All right. Uh, everybody's back. Uh, questions about any of the stuff that we've gone over, um, at least up to this point. Feeling good about this? Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So this covers, up to this point, we've covered our simultaneous regression model, right? And so with our simultaneous regression model, all of our predictors get tossed in the mix all together, and our individual coefficients are uh, get credit for unique variability associated with our outcome, and then any shared variability that's common across our predictors that just gets captured in our um, in our R squared value. So we're, it's still predictive. Uh, it's predictive variability that's getting the model is getting credit for, but no individual uh, predictor uh, gets uh, uh, paid for that. Okay. Now, a uh, different type of regression is our hierarchical regression. You sometimes hear this called uh, or referred to as sequential regression. And what we're doing here is our predictors or our set of predictors is going to get are going to be entered into our model at different stages determined by me the investigator okay but and typically how we would go through and do this a couple basic strategies in terms of our hierarchical regression um one approach and again uh sean and i had had uh, sean you had asked about this um what we often uh, call this is uh maybe like a like a well no that's a different thing never mind ignore that i didn't have that conversation with sean because we had a different conversation with sean um one thing in terms of our hierarchical regression a couple different strategies one thing we can do is let's say i've got um a bunch of predictors and i say all right, this model has been in the past, sort of these predictors, one, two, and three, have been used to predict outcome, uh, uh, this outcome, right? But I think 
from a theoretical standpoint that these other two, these additional two predictors are going to account for variability above and beyond the standard three that people will use. Okay. Um, and so what I can do is I can go through and put those two variables that I think are most important in the first step. And in the second step, then include the other three model, uh, other three variables that are standard and sort of then see how things turn out. Okay. Other thing I could do is I could start with whatever my control variables are. These are first, right? So let's say I'm wanting to predict um, some sort of outcome and I say, okay, but things like uh, biological sex and um, education level and um, personality. These are all things that might be accounting for something, but they're not super important. I'm going to throw these things in the first step. And then what I'm going to do in the second step is then include my set of predictors that I'm interested in to see what they're predicting above and beyond sort of the, the, this first set of predictors. Okay. So with the, with the, uh, first approach, what we're doing is we're going through and looking at the stuff that it's really important for my research question in the first step. And then the second step loading in stuff that's kind of nuisance background. Other step, we're taking all the nuisance background stuff, putting it at first, and then seeing whether or not my theoretical, uh, my uh, variables of theoretical importance are predicting above and beyond sort of background stuff there. Okay. Now the main thing, and this is so important, the only difference between our hierarchical models and our standard multiple regression is that we're just getting an R squared at each step. There is nothing magical about hierarchical regression. Hierarchical regression does nothing above and beyond just presenting a first set of mod or first set of variables, and then we add another set of variables in and seeing what the change in the R squared value is. Okay. What people get this confused with is uh, a stepwise regression, which is a different thing that we'll talk about. Hierarchical regression, it's just a series of simultaneous regressions where we're just seeing the unique contribution of whatever new variables uh, are added into our model. Okay. So, uh, for example, let's say again, we're still, let's still use, and this isn't a great example. I mean, Generally, what we would do with a hierarchical regression is we'd have a set of variables at each step, right? So we got two variables at step one and an additional two at step two, and then maybe three at step three. Just to keep within the same data set, I just use the same thing. So we're just going to put opiate use in block one, uh, add pain in block two, and then add PTSD in block three. Okay. And so my question is, What's the incremental contribution of pain severity to the uh, prediction of functional outcome above and beyond medication use? And then two, what's the incremental contribution of PTSD to the prediction of functional outcome above and beyond medication use and pain, right? So what we're doing is we're using kind of a, a, a step up procedure here. In uh, SPSS, what I would do, and you can see this in the video, we just go through our linear regression and then block one of one opiate use and then go to the second block pain, uh, PTSD in the third one. And then on our statistics, we're asking for R squared change in part and partial correlations. Okay. So here is an example. Well, I guess here's a, I'll pull this in. So a full example of, uh, of what our, uh, hierarchical models look like for these data is you're going to get a model summary here, an ANOVA table here, and a coefficients table here, right? So we've got block one, block two, block three, R squared values and everything like that. ANOVA for block one, block two, block three. Down here you'll see with uh, our uh, superscripts what predictors are included in each block. And then my coefficients here, uh, block one, block two, block three, my outcome variables, okay? But, Again, and this is the most important thing. If I go through and I take a look, uh, if this is the model summary for my standard regression, okay, and this is my regression model with uh, opiate use, pain, and PTSD as my predictors, and then here is my model summary for my hierarchical regression, okay. So in block one, where I have just opiate use in my model, 
This is my R squared. So opiate use is accounting for about 5% of the variability in the natural log of roll functioning. Uh, my adjusted R squared uh, and then my R squared changes just tell me whether or not this is accounting for uh, significant variability. Okay, uh, And then in block two, this is my R squared for a model with pain severity and opiate use. Uh, and then my R squared change is 0 0.304. That's telling me that with the inclusion of pain severity, my R squared value has increased by 0 0.304. Uh, I can also interpret this as saying that uh, pain severity is accounting for about 30% uh, of additional, 30 uh, uh, an increase in 30% of the total variability in outcome. Uh, relative to what was accounted for uh, by opiate use alone, right? And if I take 0.355 and subtract 0.051, Alicia, what am I going to get? Uh, 0.304. 0.304. It's just so it, this is just telling me, this is just doing the math, is how much my R square has changed from the previous block to this block, right? But then we see this F for my change. And my p-value here, this is giving me evidence for uh, an increase in that r-squared value relative to what it was before. So this obviously is a massive F, right? So we have very strong evidence that the inclusion of opiate or pain severity into this model in block two has uh, uh, resulted in an increase in my r-squared value. Okay, people see this. And then in step three. This is just my R squared for my uh, model with opiate use, pain severity, and PTSD. Here's my adjusted R squared, and here's my R squared change, right? This is telling me uh, what's the unique uh, uh, contribution of PTSD total score above and beyond pain severity and opiate use when I add that into the model. Here's my test of this, whether or not this is uh, rely or whether this is a, a different number than zero, again, getting a decent p-value for this, right? And so all that's going on in this model summary is we've got my first block with just opiate use or whatever predictors I have there. And then my second block is giving me my R squared plus sort of telling me a test of the extent to which that's increased uh, variability accounted for by the model. And then the same thing at uh, step three. Okay. Do people see what's going on here? Any questions with what's going on with this model? <clears throat> I have a question about the significant F change. Um, so would there ever be a situation in which we do have an R squared change, but like our P value is again 8.05 and it's kind of suggesting it's not important or is that not okay. present? Having strong emotional reactions to the words like significance and importance and things like that. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and this can happen, right? So let's say tomorrow I have, um, you're doing some stuff and there's a, a theoretical model that says, oh, these are important predictors, right? But then what your argument is, is like, boy, this literature really fails to account for these things, right? And so maybe you decide to set this up as a hierarchical regression. And so what you do is you take all those uh, predictors that have been identified as, in, as sort of the important things and you put those in block one. But then in block two, what you're doing is you're putting in, say, your two variables that you think are uh, sort of things that are being missed, right? And what you're hoping is that uh, you, the inclusion of these two additional variables in that second block improves your overall model, okay? Now, if I throw anything in the mix, in general, what's gonna happen to my R squared? It's gonna increase. It's gonna increase by some amount, right? But what our, uh, uh, what our hypothesis test is doing, what our formal test is doing is saying, do we have evidence that this is sort of changing uh, an increase that's different than zero? Okay, uh, and sometimes what will happen is sometimes we get an increase, but it's not something that's looking like it's really, we don't have much evidence that that's anything different than sampling variability and general noise, right? And so what will happen is I might find that when I include those second variables in the model, 
that it really doesn't have, we don't have strong evidence that has an appreciable impact on my total overall R squared. Okay. But this is the conflict that we get into uh, in um, psychological science. Because in psychological science, are we often interested, is our goal to maximize our R squared? Generally not. We're generally wanting it sort of think about theory-based stuff. So what I can get if I set up my hierarchical model is I can go through and I can say, okay, I'm going to add these variables in the second block of my model. Find very questionable, like little evidence that that's actually improved my model. But then when I go down to look at my individual predictors, see that I have evidence for those predictors holding the, uh, maybe one of those predictors entered in the second block, having uh, a unique contribution above and beyond everything else. And then we're kind of in a weird spot, right? Because my model is saying that the inclusion of these predictors didn't add anything meaningful to the overall model. It didn't change things above and beyond just general static. When I'm going down through and I'm looking at my individual predictors, my individual predictor that I was actually interested in looks like it does have a, a, a evidence of a unique association. And so then what do I do with that, right? Um, and what happens is you get people who are like very, very adamant about uh, how we go through and look at certain models, right? Um, but my argument would be, you know what, the reason I put variable X into the model was to test variable X. I'm not super interested in maximizing my R squared. So I'm not really concerned about this, right? And so this is the risk of running because then you kind of have to play by your own rules, right? If you say, oh, I'm only going to interpret these variables if they contribute something to the overall model and then the variables don't contribute anything to the overall model, well, then maybe I shouldn't be uh, interpreting those individual uh, coefficients in that block if they, as a group, didn't contribute anything to the model. But... Again, my argument would be like, I don't, I, that's asking the wrong question. I'm what I'm specifically interested. I have hypotheses about this specific predictor. So I'm just going to predict it. I'm going to interpret it anyway, but then I probably wouldn't be using a hierarchical model to begin with. Okay. So, um, Layla's, uh, uh, thesis is a good example. We're working on, uh, on Layla's thesis. And so, uh, she's using a hierarchical model where, um, and we'll talk about this in terms of power as, as we start to sort of the one thing we're often not concerned about increasing our R squared or maximizing our R squared. But if my R squared is larger, what does that, what does that mean? Chris M. Your R squared is larger. The individual uh, variables that you've included in the model account for more of the shared variability in the outcome variable. Right. So if I've got a large R squared, I'm accounting for more variability in my model. And as if I'm accounting for more variability in my outcome, what's that doing to my error? Uh, it's also decreasing error. Yeah, right. Because I've here's the total piece of the pie. I'm accounting for increasing a, a greater portion of it. The error in my, or sort of the un, unknown, sort of that uh, those residuals, that error is starting to shrink down and down. And so as my R squared increases, the power of my test to detect effects of individual predictors starts to starts to get bigger, right? Because my error is getting smaller, and if error is going into the denominator of my stuff, my tests get bigger, right? So there is benefit to sort of increasing your R squared, right? And so what we did, we were concerned about power with Layla's uh, model or in her thesis. And so what we did is we tried to find some covariates to include in the model that would be unrelated to her predictors of interest, right? But those covariates are just intended to pick up sort of more variability in my R squared so that it increases the power of my test, right? So what we did is we have three or four variables that are just covariates. They don't have any relevance to what she's looking at, but they're just there to try and account for stuff that would otherwise be unaccounted for in the outcome. So we put those in the first step, right? And in the second step, we have predictors that are actually of interest. And in the third step, we have uh, interaction terms, right? And so what we're doing is each step of the way, sort of looking at uh, the, uh, the unique contribution of the variables included at each block as we step through the model, right? And so this is a nice way to go through and maybe set up a model. But if I'm going through and taking a look at this outcome, uh, uh, Ignacio, uh, if I'm looking at my model summary for my standard regression and my model summary for my hierarchical regression, 
Are you noticing any similarities there? Yeah, the third line, third line is exactly the same. By the time we get to that third step of the model where we have all of our predictors in there, we just run the same regression as if we would have run them all in there in the first place, right? So there's no difference in the estimation in terms of what's happening, right? The only thing is that, that we're going through, and this R squared change, this is the only unique and interesting thing that we're getting out of a hierarchical regression model, okay? So if we go through, this is our model summary. Um, if I go through and I take a look at my ANOVA table, same thing here. This is my ANOVA for my overall standard regression model. Here I've got ANOVA for my regression model where I've just got opiate use as a predictor. Here's my ANOVA model for uh, my ANOVA uh, figures when I have opiate use and pain severity. And here's my uh, ANOVA for opiate use, pain severity, and PTSD. Ignacio, what's going on between uh, sort of this one and the last step? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, right. Right. And so, how does this uh, how does this ANOVA table uh, compare to the one at step three? It's identical, right? So, and then if we go down and we take a look at our coefficients, same thing. Here's our coefficients uh, for our simultaneous model with opiate use, pain, and PTSD. Here's my coefficients for opiate use. Here's my coefficients for opiate use and pain. Here's my coefficient for opiate use, pain, and PTSD. Uh, Chris C., what am I seeing in, in these uh, coefficients here? Once you get to the last one, they're exactly the same. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Okay. And so this is the important thing. People will have strange ideas about what hierarchical regression is doing and why you need to use this versus something else. If you're specifically interested in the unique contribution of a series of blocks of, of, of uh, predictors, then a hierarchical regression can be a useful way to go through because we get that R squared change. It says if we start with this and then we add this collection of variables, what's the additional contribution of this to my model R squared above and beyond? But if you're not interested in that, there's no reason to run a hierarchical regression rather than just run them all at the same time because by the time you get to the final uh, step of the model where everything gets put in there, it's the exact same thing. There's there's literally no difference between those two, okay? Um, so just be aware, right? I've been forced into running hierarchical regressions because reviewer forced me to do it, but I strenuously objected to that. Uh, and, so, and then what I ended up doing is I like had interaction terms that didn't contribute to the overall R squared, but then came up as uh, evidence that they had a unique effect. And so it was a, a whole... Sometimes you got to do it, but just know what's going on with these models and know that there's nothing magical. The only thing that you're getting is that R squared change uh, across each one of the steps. And if that's important, then this is a great model to run. If it's not, you can do it if you just like to have more tables in your output, but uh, you don't need to. Okay. Questions on this? Thinking of an example that you would rather do this than just a multiple regression. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, I mean, uh, perhaps for, and again, if I'm doing more applied type of work, right, um, where I might say I've got uh, this set of predictors that collection comes at some cost. Right. I'm looking at Sean up here and let's say Sean's uh, running some analyses for uh, a company doing some marketing stuff that's saying, um, you know, we are trying to predict revenue um, and we think that these couple of predictors or these couple of variables are going to be helpful 
um, in predicting my revenue, but it's going to create infrastructure to go through and collect this. I've got to go through and it's going to cost. I'm going to have to pay people to do it. It's going to be, it's going to be more stuff to do right when I'm running my business. And so what I might want to do is run a pilot to say, are these giving us anything above and beyond what we've already got? And if so, how much, right? So what I might do is I might say, okay, well, I've got, uh, sort of uh, general sort of various things from business paperwork that already I would use to go through and project what my revenues are going to be for down the road. But let's say for a trial for sort of this period, I'm going to go through and collect these other measures just to kind of see what happens. And then maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, this is what my model looks like in projecting revenue just with the data that I typically have. And then if I add these other variables in, this is how much better my model gets with these additional variables in, right? And if it goes through and it increases my ability to reject revenue by quite a bit, then I might say, well, it makes sense to keep collecting these because even though that comes at a cost, I'm able to, I'm the sort of, I'm accounting for an additional 20% of the variability in my ability to project outcome. And that sounds like a pretty good thing to sort of have better clarity on what my revenue stream is going to look like, right? But if it increases the predictability of my model, it sort of adds an additional 2%. That might not make sense to keep to keep collecting those data, right? It's costing me far more to get that data than it is what it's giving me on the output. And so then, you know, I'm going to say based on this, I don't have strong evidence that this is helping us out any. And so I'm just going to get rid of it. Okay. Um, when we get into moderation, some people feel very, very strongly about um, needing to have those interaction terms increase the predictability of your model before you would go through and start interpreting moderation stuff, right? My position, and so with that argument, you would go through and have your uh, first order effects in the first step of the model, and then include your interaction terms in the second step of the model. and if those interactions, those moderation effects don't uh, improve the, your overall model, the argument would be then we don't even go through and take a look at them, right? My argument would be, well, the whole reason I'm running this study is to look at the interaction terms. I have specific predictions about the interaction terms. Whether or not it adds to the model, I don't really don't care about because I'm in my ivory tower and I'm interested in the theory and ideas. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at those and interpret those regardless. So I really don't care about the change in R squared, right? But that's, uh, you will in your lifetime run against people who have very strong reviews about, or beliefs about this is the way it has to be done. But oftentimes those strong beliefs aren't backed by any sort of real good logic on why it needs to be done that way. And so that's where we start to sort of just wanting you to be informed about sort of some of the ideas and the rationales. Does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. Okay, cool. Um, other people have questions. Okay, cool. So that covers hierarchical regression, hierarchical models and SATA. A um, couple of different ways you can go through and run these uh, nest reg, and then you go through and in this, that sort of gives you lots of output. Uh, you can go through and run some different things where you can kind of get SATA to give you tables that are nice. It kind of condenses things. Um, so either way, but both will work. Uh, Alicia, you've got handouts walking you through these different things in a video. So, but all the output is the same. It's basically the same stuff you get, just the format's a little bit different. All right. Last thing is stepwise regression. Okay. Stepwise or statistical regression. This is what people are commonly confusing hierarchical regression with. If we're talking about our stepwise regression. What we're doing here, this is a data-driven approach. And what we're doing is we're entering or removing uh, predictors based on their incremental contribution, right? Or their uh, an, uh, association with the outcome. So an example, there's lots of different ways uh, you can set these models up. Um, but in a like a standard situation, what you would do is let's say I've got an outcome and I've got 20 different predictors, okay? Uh, and what I would do is say, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and I'm going to look at 
the bivariate correlations, and by me, I mean the model. Model's gonna go through and look at the bivariate correlations between each one of those predictors and the outcome, okay? And the predictor that has the highest bivariate correlation with my outcome, that gets dropped in the model. And all the shared variability that's associated between that predictor and that model, or that predictor and that outcome, goes to that predictor, okay? And so then what it does is it says, okay, of what's left over, which, uh, which uh, predictor has the strongest correlation with what's left over? It's going to identify that one. And then that predictor gets to suck up everything that it shares with the stuff that's left over. And then continue on and on and on until you got nothing that actually has any correlations. And so then what you're going to get is a final model that says maybe has seven uh, variables or predictors in it uh, that were selected on a data-driven approach based on uh, associations. Okay, So that would be what we would traditionally call a step up. Step down would be everything goes in first and then the, the least predictive one gets dropped out, sort of iterations going on there. Okay, but the difference between a statistical or a stepwise regression and the models that we've talked about to this point is that our coefficients are only associated, or our individual coefficients are capturing the unique variability with the outcome that's not shared with anything else. With this, the model that gets in first, it gets all the stuff, and it gets credit for all the stuff, right? And then the next thing gets in, it gets to pick up the scraps and whatever the scraps and the leftovers it can gather up, it gets credit for that. And then the next one and the next one and the next one, right? So what ends up happening, it's a much more data-driven approach than you saying, these are the variables that I think are important in predicting this outcome. And so these are the things that are gonna be included in the model, okay? People see how the how this is a different approach than sort of uh, the, the previous two models that we've talked about. These types of models are incredibly controversial, okay, for a number of reasons. One, there's no theoretical basis to this model. We're just like throwing stuff out there and seeing what sticks, right? So there's no theoretical or conceptual basis for why these variables. I'm just seeing what's going on, like what what what's predicting, right? And I might find that uh, a seemingly random variable has some predictive value, it is in my model, it makes no sense, I have no, un who knows why it's in there, but I don't care because I didn't have any idea about sort of why it's going in in the first place, right? Uh, and so for our uh, area in, in behavioral sciences, this idea that I'm just gonna throw stuff into a model with no rationale, rhyme or reason for why it might predict other than it does is problematic. Um, this is probably the biggest, one of the biggest problems is our final model. So I have 20, 20 variables, right? And I end up with a final model that has seven that, uh, in the, in the cage match of, uh, variable battles, like we've got seven that are remaining in here, right? So that's fine for these data, right? But if I've got two variables, right, I've got predictor A, that has a correlation of 0.43 with my outcome. And I have a predictor B that has a correlation of 0.42 with my outcome. Which variable gets entered in the model first? Point 0.43, yeah. And so all of the variability that, point, uh, that variable A shares with the outcome, it gets all of that right? Even though variable A might have several, several huge correlations with other variables, doesn't matter. It gets all of that, right? And then, so now if uh, variable A and variable B uh, are highly correlated with one another, once variables A is let in there, of what's left over, variable B doesn't contribute much. And so what happens to variable B? It gets kicked out. It might not even be in the model, right? So you go through and Chris uh, C runs a model. He says variable A is the variable. Like this is the thing that's the most important predictor and variable B sucks and it's not even in there. It doesn't even make a difference, right? But then tomorrow you run 
uh, in a separate sample, the analyses, right? And this time, variable B holds a correlation of 0.45 with the outcome, and variable A correlates 0.44. Who gets put at the top of the list? Variable B. Now I've got a completely different model that looks nothing like the previous model based on tiny incremental differences uh, across these, right? And if we know anything about statistics, we know that sort of sample specific statistics like rank order, which one's highest and which one's not, could be completely scrambled around the next time we run around this, right? And so what we end up is we end up with solutions that oftentimes will start to depend on trivial sample specific features, right? Not anything that's meaningful about the phenomena of interest. And what we see is that our solutions tend to overfit the data. I've got a model that does a great job of accounting for variability in this set that I have right in front of me. But this model that I have may be really terrible in any other possible sample that I could collect from here on out, right? And so we start to worry about generalizability and things like that. And it makes this, this, uh, this solution look really, really good when in fact it doesn't. It's just overfitted this, the nuances of this specific data and is never going to fit another model or another data set nearly as well, okay? So for these reasons, um, there are procedures and there are areas that will use these data-driven approaches for uh, these stepwise regression models, but you're unlikely to encounter these in psychological science um, just because these are not models that tend to be used because they don't map on well to the types of things that we do. Questions on this? People see the, the difference between uh, the stepwise regression, the hierarchical regression. People often will get these uh, these mixed around. So I think I have a very basic understanding of, um, so thinking about like if we have a bunch of variables and we're trying to figure out which, which are the best ones, which are more predictive, thinking about like, um, so I've like heard about kind of principal components analysis what yeah. sort of, I guess, utility or any sort of comparison does that have the, to this and like the types of ideas that one might want to use? Yeah, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the, um, the, the idea and the approach is, is similar because with a, P, uh, a PCA, what you would do is you would say, and this is a way that some people will say, oh, we're going to use this to deal with collinearity. We're going to create composites of these uh, predictors that are all very highly correlated with one another, right? Um, and sometimes what people will use, what you sometimes see stepwise regression used for is I have... Um, I just, I'm walking in, I have a massive data set and I have a thousand different predictors and I'm just going to run this model and see what pops up, right? Like what are the important things in here, right? Um, it's just not a situation that we're often confronted with in psychological science because most of the stuff that we're doing, we're collecting the data ourselves. And so I'm not going to go through and collect 500 different variables just to see what happens, right? Because I don't have the time and resources to do that. Um, uh, and if I'm going to publish something, I probably need to have some sort of reasonable reason for doing the things that I've done, right? Um, so it's not something that often happens. But if I get into data that's existing, archival data, um, and oftentimes for more applied types of stuff, uh, Ignacio and Sean, I would imagine uh, that you might do... In marketing, do you do you all run into uh, these stepwise regression models ever? Yes, but it's not a it's not convenient because when you run it, uh, you need a big bunch of variation of other possibilities that you actually if you are in field you don't know what is going on. Yeah, yeah. So it's rather to look more general the other, the other approach. Yeah. And so, and, you know, there are uh, one of the sort of areas of development in um, quantitative computing right now are uh, some of these data-driven machine learning models that are going through and looking at, you know, all combinations and interactions of variables and trying to go through and, and work through stuff. Um, but the, again, the, the concern is always that I come up with a solution that does an amazing job with these data that are sitting in front of me 
that have zero value in any other set that I would ever go through and do, right? And so you converge on something that uh, captures the nuances of this set, but then doesn't mean anything else anywhere else, right? Um, and so that's kind of the big concern with this. <laughs> yeah, what we do, we don't call it cherry picking. We call it a data driven approach, which is kind of the same thing, right? Um, uh, I'm not eyeballing the data and, and uh, picking out the lowest hanging fruit the, the, uh, the program is. I can't be responsible what the program does. So yeah, we just don't see this, these types of models a whole lot in our, uh, in our uh, research, but uh, they will come up and there are best practices. People it's not that you can't use these or couldn't use these in a best practice approach. It's just we're unlikely to, we often don't run into scenarios in behavioral sciences where this starts to become an issue. All right. Uh, <clears throat> finish up with a couple of practical issues. Uh, model selection. Um, always remember and this is something that happens you know when I, people come in and they're like oh well you know i collected these data and i went and did this and it turns out that these are all terrible i measured role functioning and i thought it was a, i saw it was a zero to 100 scale so i turned it i sort of gave it and it actually turns out to be it's a ordinal scale and the measurement qualities are garbage what do i do with that is there a statistical fix to that no, right? Um, like your model is only as good as the variables that you put into it. Um, and there are not statistical fixes for uh, poor methodology, right? So when you're thinking about running your models, um, if you want a model that's replicable and doing a good job and powerful and what it's uh, doing, what it, it should be doing, uh, what you want to do is be very, very careful about uh, what variables you select as predictors, and then how you're assessing those, right? Um, if I assess, so in my field, let's say I go through and I uh, want to collect um, PTSD scores from undergraduates, but I don't actually assess for whether or not any of those people have been exposed to trauma, I just, I have a bad measure it's uninterpretable right um is there a statistical fix for that nope i just got a bunch of garbage data that i can't use i mean i can i can do it's free country i can run whatever analysis I, I want on it but it's it's not interpretable right so making sure that when you're going through and thinking about these models that you're thinking about what variables need to be in here what variables don't need to be in here uh, and then how do I go through and put things together again from a, 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 ba a basic statistical standpoint our models are going to be most efficient when my predictors are maximally associated with my outcomes and minimally associated with one another okay and this starts to get hard in uh, behavioral sciences because a lot of our measures are all you know highly correlated with one another right I've got depression and PTSD and negative affect on the same model I there it's all measuring kind of the same stuff that's not a good model right or you know I'm an experimental person I'm like oh I'm gonna look at self-esteem and motivation and handicapping well, those are all those uh, constructs are all stacked right on top of one another right and my core and my predictors are all going to be maximally correlated i'm going to run into problems right what we should be thinking about is what's my outcome and what are the variables that are important to be including and for the variables that i've included once i include those what's left over what's other things that are probably unrelated to this predictor that are still relevant to include so that i can go through and, and pull stuff out right um so i don't know let me see and this was just uh, we did this for layla's uh thesis right because we were concerned we talked about how this is related to um uh power right and so she's looking at uh the unique and interactive effects of P 
PTSD and empathy on um, interpersonal functioning, right? And so then the question was, is what, if we think about what's shared with PTSD and empathy with interpersonal functioning, what other types of stuff that are going to be kind of, what are, are there other predictors that are unrelated to PTSD and uh, empathy that are still probably important aspects of interpersonal functioning, right? And the idea is to find variables that are uncorrelated with the variables of interest, but still accounting for stuff, right? And so looking at as covariates, she included some uh, personality uh, constructs, right? Because we might suspect that personality might have some relation with interpersonal functioning outside of pathology and empathy, right? Um, expressive behavior, right? Or uh, emotional regulation stuff, uh, expressive regulation, right? Because if I'm flat, I'm probably not going to be super interpersonally good. So some stuff there. Um, this poppers, I can't remember what that is. It's, it's in a childhood relationships or something like that, right? So the idea was to find, in addition to the variables of interest, are there other things that account for interpersonal functioning that I can include in the model that are going to be unrelated to my variables, but still accounting for variab total variability in my outcome? Because again, uh, as uh, Chris Emmett noted, the idea is what we're kind of do is trying to expand that R squared to shrink up that error variance so that it's uh, giving me a, a stronger test of my individual coefficients. Okay. So thinking carefully about um, uh, the models and uh, sort of the model development, uh, and then in terms of sample size, right? Um, larger samples are better than smaller samples, okay? Um, uh, if you don't, if you have more predictors than you have observations in your data set, you can't run the model. But the question is always, oh, how many, how many people do I need in my sample to sort of, how many is an adequate number of people for my sample? Well, it depends on a lot of stuff. It depends on number of predictors, sort of your alpha levels, what your test levels are, uh, the effect sizes you're anticipating, how much power you want. Um, if my dependent variables are skewed or I have small effect sizes, I need larger samples. If my reliability is not good, I need larger samples. There are lots and lots of resources out there that will give you rules of thumb for how many variables or how many observations I need for my model. And like, oh, you need at least 10 observations for every predictor, so on and so forth. Those are all garbage. None of those are any good. Um, if you're interested in how many uh, the size of the sample that you need, run a power analysis, right? That That's your solution. That's your responsible solution as opposed to, to rules of thumb. Rule of thumb is bigger samples are better than smaller samples, right? Um, but if you want to know, like, how many people do I need to detect uh, the, uh, uh, the effects that I want to detect, power analysis is going to be your best bet, but recognizing that nuances of the data in terms of distribution and things like that and reliability methodological aspects all these come into play in terms of um, generating an expected sample okay so um, and you know just a rough estimate and again with power our power analyses is more like horseshoes uh, than um, sort of target shooting right it's just kind of about this area but for regression regression is a large sample technique you should expect to be needing more people than less people as you're going through and putting together these models okay all right questions okay people getting uh getting the difference to be able to differentiate between uh hierarchical regression um uh uh, simultaneous regression, stepwise regression, things along these lines. Okay, cool. Uh, let's go through, take another five, and we'll jump into moderation stuff. All right. So uh, this is going to be, we're going to spend a lot of time or sort of considerable amount of time uh, with moderation working through. Um, procedures are pretty complicated. Um, 
at the end we might talk about some shortcuts how you go through and and uh, streamline this process but at the end of the day uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here and a lot of ways to screw it up uh, so I want you to know how to go through and check and make sure that the stuff that you've got uh, is making sense and is correct so we're going to start about talk about conceptually when we're talking about moderations what's going on do a little uh, talking about uh, centering <clears throat> within the context of additive models going to introduce multiple uh, multiplicative models and interactions uh, testing simple slopes standardized models and then some moderation with uh, categorical variables talking about some curvilinear nonlinear effects and then finish up with the reliability effect size power types of things okay so our regression models that we've done uh, work through to this point do a really nice job of capturing unique effects of predictors on outcomes right if I regress this outcome onto a predictor set of predictors saying controlling for everything else in the model what's the unique effect of this uh, variable on or the unique association of this variable on on outcome stuff right um, but if I do this again and again and again and again and again right um, so I don't know uh, Nick what's a what's within your field or within your area or research that you're familiar with what's can you give an example of a, of a strong and well-established association uh, yeah impulsivity and substance use okay Kate perfect right so if I've gone through and there's a thousand different studies that have gone through and demonstrated an association between impulsivity and substance use and this has been shown a number of times over a number of different studies with a number of different measures after a while if Nick comes up with a thesis that says hey I'm gonna look at the uh, at the relation between substance use impulsivity and substance use does anybody care about Nick's uh, thesis no it's not interesting it's not because we already know this right um, and our standard regression models are pretty limited in sort of detecting or sort of asking questions that move beyond kind of horse race stuff. What is the unique effect of X on Y uh, controlling for these other mo uh, other variables, right? And so if we've got strong evidence for an effect of, in a population, if we know that impulsivity is associated with substance use, one thing that we might want to do to extend this is start asking so under what conditions does this effect hold, right? Is impulsivity always and forever under all circumstances for all people directly holding a positive association with substance use, right? Or are there certain factors or certain conditions that start to change the strength or direction of this association, right? And if those are the questions that I have, if I'm interested in the boundary conditions, are there situations where or populations or uh, conditions under which impulsivity is not related to increased substance use, this is what we're starting to get interested in terms of moderation effects. Okay, so moderation, and we wanted sometimes people start you throwing around moderation, mediation interchangeably, which isn't good. Uh, if we're talking about from a research standpoint, moderation, this is going to be a process where some third external variable starts to change in the nature of the association between X and Y, right? I've got, Nick's got a base relation between impulsivity and substance use that's very well established. What we might start wanting to do is look under what conditions, what types of things start to strengthen or weaken that relationship, right? Because I'm, gonna, I'm not even going out on a limb. I'm going to say there is no association in all of psychology between X and Y that is invariant across all circumstances, people's situations for always and forever. There's no association out there that's always the same under all circumstances, right? Uh, there are theoretically an infinite number of moderations, uh, moderating variables out there, right? And so if I'm trying to understand something about a phenomenon, Starting to think about like under what conditions does this association hold can start to be interesting in terms of thinking about theory, implications, practice, things along these lines. Okay. <clears throat> so if I'm talking about a moderator, then a moderator is going to be any variable 
this starts to impact the magnitude or direction of the relation between some x and y variable. Okay, uh, this is typically um, what we're doing in terms of uh, when we're looking at trying to diagram this. We're saying here's the relation between x and y, and then what is this variable that is going down through and impacting the nature of this relationship, right? Here we've got uh, m as a moderator changing or influencing either the strength or the direction of the association between x and y, okay? So when you're thinking about this, the relation between x and y, that's my sort of main thing, and then my moderator is something that's going through and changing this or influencing it, okay? People, questions about sort of generally what we're talking about in terms of moderator, how we're thinking about this? Okay, so for an example, uh, we might find that the impact of stress on physical health depends on the degree of social support, right? Any any thoughts on Alicia, uh, because this kind of relates to our area, what if we had if you had to guess what might be your expected relationship on the impact of social support on the relation between stress and physical health so i would expect that as stress increases physical health decreases how might social support impact that Beautiful, right? And so what we might find is that yes, overall, level of stress has an impact, negative impact on physical health. As my stress level goes up, my physical health goes down. But if I happen to have high levels of social support, we might see that relation between uh, stress and physical health start to become weaker, right? Uh, if I have high levels of support, my uh, level of stress may be less associated with my physical health. We might see a decoupling of that, right? But what about the the opposite tomorrow? If, if I have very, very little social support, what might that do to the uh, strength of the relation between uh, stress and physical health? Decreasing. Makes it much stronger, right? And so what we're doing with this moderation analysis is we're looking at factors that are impacting the nature of that association, right? Same thing. Uh, we say the relation between psychological distress and problematic substance use differs across men and women. Uh, Nick, I guess I'll go back to you. How might we, what what might be the moderating effect of uh, sex on the relation between distress or negative affect and substance use? Right. Right. We might find that perhaps um, uh, substance use is uh, something that is more prominent as a coping strategy in men, and so for men, we see a fairly strong associate, or a, at least a a reliable association between increased uh, increased levels of distress and substance use. Whereas women, we might not see as strong of a correlation, or maybe no correlation at all. Right. Um, and these are all going to be uh, examples of questions that would be addressed with a moderation analysis. OK, so again, our moderation, uh, these uh, appro this approach is going to look at the conditions where a given association is strengthened or weakened. And if we do find an interactive effect, uh, what we're saying is that association between X and Y is conditioned on M. So what we're finding is a conditional association of X on Y that depends and varies based on levels of my moderator. Okay. Uh, Chris C., have we talked about this type of stuff before? Yes. Yeah, what did we talk I about this? When. I, it was sometime last semester, I think. Last maybe, semester? Maybe it's this semester. It, it feels like forever ago. I yeah. know we talked about it, and we're like, oh, this is just moderation. Yeah, Chris M., what do we talk about this? Was it the moderating effects of cargo shorts on the amount of Dave Matthews games? Oh, look at this guy. Look at this guy. Those are all independent and invariant. Invariant. That's just a, 
You, your third your third unexplained variable is just general coolness, and that's that's the third variable driving all of it. Okay. I got so excited, I almost wasn't able to get that out. All right, that's good. I give you I give you I give you a B plus on delivery. Right. Now, when did when, so when did when did we when did, when did we talked about this? Have we have we have we run other analyses that sort of are doing something similar to this? Yes. <laughs> was it, was it, was Give it, me the first letter. Anova. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. When we're looking at our factorial, any interaction effect that we're looking at with our with our means based test, right? Or any type of interaction with these those are in a, uh, moderation analyses, right? The difference between uh, group A and group B is dependent on some other factor, right? That's a moderating uh, factor, right? So to my group difference is being moderated by this other thing. So uh, any time, like for all those factorial ANOVAs, the mixed factors, repeated measures designs, it's moderation analyses, right? Um, and so seeing sort of the connection between these two is going to be important. Okay, so conceptually, people understanding what's going on with moderation. Okay, so um, these interactive effects have historically been examined with ANOVA, and if we're using uh, looking at um, variables that are naturally categorical, ANOVA's a perfectly fine approach, and probably an approach that you should use, right? Uh, so let's say I'm looking at the interactive effects of uh, sex and ethnicity on social bonding, right? Looking at cultural differences across uh, gender roles and, and uh, culture uh, that impacts social bonding. Cool. Two by two ANOVA works fine there if what my groups are men, women, uh, and people who identify as white, black, and sort of then throw, go through and take a look at that. ANOVA is fine, right? But when I start looking at uh, or interested in the interactions of variables that are continuous, now all of a sudden these ANOVA models start to become not so great, right? So I'm interested in the interaction of sex and SES on institutional salary, right? So does uh, biological sex impact sort of my family's SES and my eventual salary, okay? Well, we can say, okay, uh, biological sex, we can model that as a dichotomous variable, but SES, can we dichotomize? Uh, can we say high SES, low SES? We could, right? But that's not a good representation of what we conceptualize as this construct of socioeconomic status is probably much better uh, thought of as a continuous variable ranging from sort of low end to the high end, right? And so what we've typically done uh, within our field is rely on median splits, right? So I say, okay, well, SES is measured continuously. <clears throat> but that's inconvenient for the ANOVA that I want to run. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and look at median value on my SES variable, and then I'm going to say, okay, anybody above the median is high SES, everybody below the median is low SES, and then I'm going to use that as a uh, variable in my ANOVA, right? You can do this, but it's a terrible approach. What we do is we end up uh, with potential for biases, uh, we end up with uh, loss of power because we're sort of minimizing that. What we have is sort of people at the high end and low end, right? If I'm looking at uh, someone who is living in poverty and uh, Elon Musk, right? Those are obviously different folks. But at some point, you've got people right there on the median, probably the majority of people and some of them are uh, being included with Elon Musk. Other people are being associated with someone who's functionally homeless. And you're saying all those people are the same, right? And they're not, right? And so what we do when we go through and do these median splits uh, in an effort to look at our interactive effects, uh, we start to get problems. Okay? With our regression models, though, what we can do is we can start looking at interactions of any combination of continuous and uh, categorical predictors given a proper... Uh, coding of stuff. And what we're doing with this is we're retaining all the information in that SES variable, right? We're including the sort of incremental sort of differences across the whole range without having to artificially dichotomize or categorize and, and, and split people up in, in things. This is a much, much, much better way to do things. 
And at this stage of the game, with the analytic tools available to us, I am having a hard time thinking of a reason or a situation where it would make sense to median split some sort of reasonably distributed continuous variable. Okay. Now, if we get back to our role functioning variable, right, Sean, I think you had mentioned, like, could we just split this into yes, no? That would might be, I, you could see an argument there, just given the distribution of that. But if I have something that is occurring on a sort of relatively normal distribution, just a chop it in the middle, say these are high, these are low, probably isn't going to make any sense. And you don't need to because we got uh, better methods of addressing that. What about like SCS splitting it at the poverty line where there's like some kind of demarcation there? Yeah, I mean... The argument would be, and this is the same argument we have with uh, clinical diagnoses, right? Like at some point we say, okay, this is the diagnosis. You're meeting diagnosis for depression, and at some point you're not, right? And so there's it's sort of the we can start to question sort of how objective that line is, and then the other piece too is so we say, okay, here are the people who are below poverty, and then here are the people who are above poverty, right? But depending on what we're looking at you might say that sort of everybody falling in that below poverty line is fairly homogenous and kind of comparable, maybe, but even that's questionable. You're going to have graduate students falling below the poverty line, right? And those, you all are a very different population than someone who's a, a single parent sort of uh, uh, surviving on government assistance with several children sort of living in sort of an unsafe neighborhood, right? And so even there, it starts to become it starts to become a, a tricky thing. And then you've got people above the poverty line. Yeah, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I'm not below poverty, but I'm also not in the same sort of uh, situation as someone making, you know, six figure salary a year uh, and sort of that type of thing, right? And so the the concern is we're saying when we categorize, when we dichotomize, we're saying everybody in this group is the same. Everybody in that group's the same, but in actual fact, what we might do, it starts to get super, super messy, right? Depending on what we're looking at. Does that kind of help with some of that stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, but the nice thing what we can do then is we don't actually need to dichotomize anything because we can go through and we can run this in a regression. And so for an example, we're going to keep the, the same data set that we've been working with just because kind of we're familiar with it. Um, but we're going to start to ask some moderation questions here. Um, so I've got a couple of questions here. So my question is, do opiate medications impact the uh, influence, uh, the impact of physical pain on role functioning in uh, survivors of serious motor vehicle accidents? Okay. So, um, Alicia, in for this first question, what is what is my what is my moderator here? The medication. Yeah, right. My base relation is the association of physical pain and role functioning. I'm not interested in whether or not physical pain is associated with role functioning because I know it is, right? As my pain increases, my role functioning decreases. That's not interesting. Well, I've got these medications that are supposed to help that. Right. And so what is the impact of these medications on pain and role functioning? Uh, Alicia, what would I what would I hope is might be hoping is going to happen with this? If the medications would lessen the physical pain, thereby uh, decreasing or increasing the functioning. OK, but what 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 uh, impact might should or might I hypothesize that medications have on the association between pain and role functioning? Should medication use make that association stronger or weaker? Weaker. Yeah, right, because hopefully, even though I have high levels of physical pain, Maybe medication use decreases that uh, association, right? Because my functioning is getting a little bit better, right? So that's one question. Then our other question, does pain severity uh, change the relationship between uh, PTSD and role functioning following a motor vehicle accident? Uh, Silo, what's my moderator here? The moderator would be the pain severity. 
Yeah, right? And so I've got this association between PTSD and role functioning. In the first question, pain was m part of my base relation. In the second question, pain's my moderator, right? Um, and so what we can do within the same model is start looking at a couple of different things. So here, pain, opioid use, PTSD, you're all familiar with that. And then for these series, I've I've elected to forget that we have, uh, that we log transform that. We're just going to go through role functioning in general just because it'll make it easier to go through and talk about things. So we're just talking about this uh, role functioning variable, even though we know it has problems. Okay. So first thing we want to do before we start going in, and this isn't just moderation analyses. This is going to be probably for most uh, regression models that you run. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm going to encourage you to do before you start running your analyses is to go through and uh, for all of your predictors, wanting to center those predictors. Okay, And when we're centering, what we're doing is we're just changing the scale of our predictor so that the sample, uh, so that the sample mean is going to be equal to zero. Okay, And what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to take every Let's say I've got PTSD and I want to center PTSD. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, everybody's score for PTSD and I'm going to subtract the mean from everybody's score. Okay. And when I do this, what's going to happen is now let's say my mean, my internet just went out. Oh, there it is. It popped back in. Okay. Um, what I want to do then is check it, change it so my scale shifts everything over to zero. Uh, and so my mean is now zero, uh, but my standard deviation is going to be the same. No change in my standard deviation. Okay. So let's say I've got a variable. My variable here has a mean of 5.6 and a standard deviation of 2.3. Okay. It's got a nice standard distribution here. Here's my uh, mean value mean value of 5.6. This is a standard deviation above, standard deviation below, two above, two below. We're doing good there, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take every score in my set and I'm going to subtract the sample mean from that, right? And so here, let's say that I have a value, or here's my value of zero, right? Down here at the end, okay? If I go through and I center this variable, what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract zero, or excuse me, subtract the sample mean. So from all scores in my sample, I'm going to try to subtract 5.6. In my centered variable, my mean is now zero. Okay. This value, so the person that was zero here, is now negative five something down here at the end. So everybody's position stays the same. Standard deviation stays the same. What I've just done is I've recentered this variable so that the mean value is equal to zero. Okay. Um, any thoughts on why centering might be advantageous? Or what about how we estimate our regressions might make centering something that is worth looking into? Yeah, so that and that's when we get into and when we get into uh, our regression model or our interaction models, that's something that's uh, been proposed and it does. Although people have gotten in statistic fights on whether or not we should do that, um, but yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, in our interaction terms, it, it reduces uh, observed uh, collinearity between our variables. But what else does this do? Remember that if I'm looking at any of my coefficients, right? Uh, Sean, this is the unique uh, effect of pain on role functioning when what? When all other uh, variables are like constant. At? The, uh, the population mean. It gets that way, but technically within the context of regression, 
This is the effect of x on y when all other variables are held constant at zero. Okay, so if I go through and if I say my coefficient for pain severity is 0.685, right? So 0.685 right here. This is the relation between pain and outcome when all my other variables are held constant at zero. Okay, so zero has an important uh, zero has an important meaning in regression because for my individual predictors, this is the estimated effect of x on y. And when I say when I'm controlling for all other variables, it's a literally meaning when all of my other variables are held constant at zero. Okay, but what happens is zero always a meaningful a meaningful value for my predictors? No, right? Chris, let's say I'm looking at the association um, of uh, weight and some other thing on eating behavior, right? A, the, what else might we want to look at eating behavior? Uh, I don't know. I don't feel like these fast okay, so uh, the association between uh, uh, physical weight and days fasting on some sort of eating outcome or something like that, right? Does it make sense to hold weight constant at zero? No. Who has zero weight? That's not a real thing, right? And so the problem is, and so one of the, probably the main reasons we want to take a look at this is because our regression models are telling us the effect of X on Y when everything else in the model is held uh, equal to zero. But zero is often or rarely a meaningful or useful value to hold anything at, right? But if I go through and I center all of my predictors, what does zero now represent, Sean? The average. The average, the mean, right? And so that's a much more interesting question to look at the effect of fasting behavior on, or fasting on eating behaviors, holding, uh, holding uh, weight constant at, these, at the sample average, okay? And so what we're doing with centering is we're just taking the uh, our predictor and we're just shifting it over. It doesn't change anything, but it's just shifting it over. So zero now represents the mean of that variable or the mean of the sample, right? And so now what I'm looking at is, yes, I'm looking at the unique effect of X on Y when all other variables are held constant at zero. What that really means is the unique effect of X on Y when all other variables are held constant at the mean. What I've done is I've rescaled my variable so that zero now uh, refers to the mean of that uh, of that sample. Okay. So what we see uh, in terms of benefits of uh, of centering, um, more interpretable models, right? Because holding things constant now means holding things constant at the mean, which is a real representative value as opposed to holding things constant at zero, which might not even be on the scale, right? Um, if I've got a, a measure of extroversion that runs from 20 to uh, 76 zero is not even is not it's not a it's a nonsensical value right um, it facilitates the calculation of our interactions and we'll see this and it also as you know, uh, mentioned addresses collinearity in my interaction terms now the actual practical impact and for my model in OLS regression is nothing um, but there are reasons to go through and do that anyway when you start getting into other estimators okay People have questions on centering. Do these kind of see what we're doing with, with centering here? Okay, cool. So uh, when I go through and I center, what I'm doing is I'm rescaling by an additive constant, right? So I'm just uh, taking uh, all of the values in my set and I'm subtracting from the mean. And what it does is it rescales it. Um, it makes the mean now equal to zero, but doesn't have any impact on the variability, shape, all that's fine, okay? Um, centering doesn't impact my correlations, my regression coefficients. If I don't have any interaction effects, those are all the same. Um, centering will change coefficients in the model with if I have interaction terms in there, except for coefficients of my higher order terms. So if I have two-way interactions, and then a bunch of uh, first-order effects. It'll change, centering will change the coefficients for my first-order effects, but it won't change my interaction, the coefficients for my interactions. 
If I have a three-way interaction, centering will change the coefficients from my two-way of interactions and for my first order effects, but it won't change the third way, three-way interaction. If I have a four-way interaction, you shouldn't. There's no reason to have a four-way interaction with this, but if you did, sort of the higher order effects will say the same, but everything below that will change with centering, and we'll talk about why that is, okay? Um, but my simple slopes that we're going to go through, those are not uh, impacted. Uh, the shape of my simple slopes plot isn't going to impact be impacted at all. All we're doing is we're taking this distribution and we're just sliding it around. Okay. So, uh, questions on what we're doing with this uh, centering procedure or why this is important. Okay. So, uh, for my multiple regression, for uh, uh, the model that we ran, uh, we've got my role functioning variable regressed onto pain, opiate use, and PTSD. Yeah. Um, so in a centered solution, pain and PTSD centered at their respective means, right? Um, so we take the sample mean, subtract it from every value of pain, sample mean for PTSD, uh, uh, subtract that, uh, every value of PTSD from the sample mean, get that so both of those are centered. My opiate use, this is a dichotomous variable, and there are reasons to center this. Um, if I have a perfectly balanced design, so the equal numbers of PTSD who are people who are taking opiate use, opiates and not, if I center that, then non-use is now equal to negative 0.5, use is equal to 0.5, but only in a balanced design. Right? If I have an unequal distribution, if I have 20% 20, 20 not taking and 80% who are taking, centering is, is not going to put it at negative 0.5 and 0.5. It's going to shift it around. So just be aware of that. Okay. Um, but uh, if I go through and I do and I center, what I'm going to get is a model uh, where I have, uh, so here's my intercept, coefficient for centered pain, coefficient for centered PTSD, or opiate use, and coefficient for centered PTSD. Okay. So what are the interpretations of, of my coefficients? Tomorrow, what is, what is the coefficient, or what is the, uh, what is the interpretation of this intercept coefficient here? To be yeah, perfect. And what does it mean in our centered model if we're holding pain, opiate use, and PTSD constant at zero? Oh, like their mean? Yeah, right. And so think about this. Like your the the interpretation that you gave is one hundred percent correct, always and forever, right? Uh, but what we want to start doing, and this starts to become incredibly important with these moderation models. And as you start to get into HLMs and things along those lines, multi-level models, think about what does zero mean? What does zero represent? In this model, for pain and PTSD, it, it accounts for holding those uh, both of those variables constant at the mean, right? Um, for opiate use, there's not a mean of opiate use. A mean of opiate use isn't a thing. But what we can say within this model is that by center opiate use, I can say it controls for it. Okay, because if I don't center opiate use, what is uh, what is the coefficient? What does this coefficient represent? So this is going to be the expected value of uh, my outcome when pain, opiate use, and PTSD are held constant at zero, right? But what does it mean in my uncentered opiate use? If opiate use is held constant at zero, who am I talking about? Use. Yeah, right. And this starts to become uh, important when we're working into our moderation models because now what I've do, done is I've, I'm holding pain and PTSD constant at the mean, but who I'm looking at, my coefficient is corresponding to people who don't use opiates, right? If I center this, it just kind of controls it, takes it out of the mix. And so I can say controlling for opiate use. This is the expected value of why when PTSD and pain are held constant at their mean, right? Um, but if I don't, 
I've been saying this is the expected value of the outcome for non-users when PTSD and opiate or PTSD and, and pain are held constant at the mean. Okay, this is an incredibly incredibly important principle. Do people see why it starts to become important when we're interpreting our coefficients? Why we need to know what that zero value is? Okay, so same thing. This is the unique effect of uh, pain on role functioning uh, when uh, controlling when PTSD is held constant at uh, the mean and controlling for opiate use. Um, this is the effect, a unique effect of opiate use on outcome uh, when pain and PTSD are held constant at the mean, right? So just making sure that you know kind of what the, the interpretations of these are. Hey, Josh. Yeah. Can you help me? Uh, so if you go back one slide. Yeah. You said that the regression um, coefficients don't change if we center or not. So if, if the equation looks the same, how do we... Yeah. How differentiate between talking about at zero or at the mean? Uh, Sean, I could jump through the screen and hug you. Uh, uh, you're exactly right. Um, and we're going to see for our for our base models for just our additive regression models, it's not going to make that. It's not going to make a difference. But only for the error models. What's up? Yeah. As soon as as soon as you as we get into our action terms, then that's when it's going to start making a difference. Okay. Um. So uh, here is my model up here with my uncentered solution. Down here is my centered solution. Uh, Sean, what, what differences are you seeing across these two outputs? Uh, the coefficients are different. The unstandardized are different, but the standardized are the same. Are the unstandardized different? Constants different. The, oh, I'm sorry. Just the constants different. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at this, the centered, uncentered solution and the centered solution are identical. R squared is the same. Uh, my f values are going to be the same. Uh, my unstandardized coefficients, my standardized coefficients, everything's going to be the same. Only thing that changes is my constant. And why is that? Because we've shifted it from zero to the mean. Yeah. Here, my constant rep 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 represents the expected value of role functioning when everything is held constant at zero. Here, constant uh, represents the expected value of role functioning when everything is held constant at zero, right? But what zero means differs across these models, okay? Here, my constant is telling me my expected value of role functioning when pain for this is my uh so in this uncentered model this is the expected value of role functioning for people who aren't using opiate you who aren't using opiates when pain and ptsd are at zero right which means no pain and no ptsd and so our zero to 100 role functioning projected looks pretty good there right here same thing this is the expected value of my outcome when all my other variables are held constant at zero. But this is the expected value of role functioning controlling for opiate use when pain and PTSD are held constant at their mean, right? And so we see much lower levels uh, expected value here as opposed to here. My effects didn't change. My coefficients are all identical. But what does change is my constant. And it makes sense if we're thinking about what this model is actually telling me. We're using OLS regression. OLS regression is always going to give us the expected uh, uh, value of our outcome, or excuse me, uh, the unique effect uh, holding all other variables constant at zero. But if we start playing around with what zero means, that starts to change the functional interpretation of my coefficients. So for the additive model, the only thing that changes is the constant, but it makes sense if we think about what's going on here. Again, when all variables are held constant at zero in the uncentered solution, it means no users with pain and with no uh, no users uh, no non opiate users with zero uh, scores on pain and zero scores on PTSD. Here, holding zero at all uh, in my centered solution, holding all variables constant at zero means controlling for opiate use with pain and PTSD held constant at their mean value. Okay. 
So people starting to see kind of the how this centering starts to impact sort of the the, the interpretation of some of our coefficients here. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is just getting to, Sean, uh, we'll finish up with kind of to your point, right? So again, with our additive model, right? We're asking sort of whether or not uh, sort of change in the relation between predictors and outcomes at different levels of our moderator, right? And so my question is, what's the relation of opiate use on role functioning uh, at different levels of pain and PTSD, right? So here is my additive model, right? And so what I can do is I can start plugging in different values and seeing the impact, right? So let's say, what's the influence of opiate use on role functioning for people with high levels of pain and high levels of PTSD, right? Well, what I can do is I can just take my model and start plugging values in, okay? So here's my model, and I'm interested in the effect of opiate use on role functioning. Well, let's say high levels of pain and high levels of PTSD. Well, let's say a standard deviation above, because I've centered these High levels of pain, standard deviation above are 1.34. Low pain, negative 1.34. High PTSD, 19.76. Low PTSD, PTSD negative 19.76. No opiates, negative 0.5. Opiates, 0.5, right? So if I go through and I plug high levels of pain, 19.76, and high levels of, uh, or PTSD, and high levels of pain, 1.34. If I go through and I run this out, I find that the unique effect of opiate use on uh, role functioning at high levels of pain and PTSD is negative 0.69. Okay. Well, let's say I want to go through, and so if I go through and look at uh, the difference between opiate use, uh, people who are using opiates and not using opiates, uh, I see that non-opiate users, plugging zero into here, have an expected value of role functioning of 29.65. People who are using 28.96, Sean, what's the difference between 29.65 and 28.96? 0.7? Yeah, negative 0.69, right? Okay, well, let's say I want to go through, let's say I'm going to look at low pain and high PTSD, okay? So I'm going to go through, here's my regression model, and now I'm going to substitute in high pain. Instead of high pain, I'm going to put low pain in there and high PTSD. If I go through and I run this out, I'm going to need a value, uh, equation says 58.01 times negative 0.69 opiate use. What's my relation between opiate use and PTSD? Same as it was before, right? If I go through and I run this out, no opiate users and opiate users, 58.36 versus 57.67. Sean, what's the difference between 58.36 and 57.67? 0.69, right? Same thing if we go through and we uh, switch things around, low pain and opiate use. Plugging things in, I get an effective PTSD and outcome of negative 0.23, right? If I go high pain and no opiate use, negative 0.23, right? And so what ends up happening in my standard additive models, the unique effect of X on Y is going to be the same across all other levels of predictors. The effect on X on Y is constant in my additive model. There's no way for pain to, I haven't modeled a, a way for pain to functionally impact the relation of PTSD or opiate use or any other such thing when I just have additive functions here. There's no way, and if I go through and I take a look at this, the unique effect of PTSD and role functioning is going to be the same. This coefficient is going to be identical no matter what values I plug in for these other variables. It's always, always, always going to be the same, okay? And so what ends up happening, if I have moderation questions, I can't test these in a standard additive model because there's mathematically no way for pain levels to impact the relation between PTSD uh, and role functioning, or the, uh, no way for opiate use to impact the relation between pain and outcome with our standard additive regression models, okay? So what I need to do if I have moderation questions is I need to start building interaction terms, okay? How are people feeling about uh, 
stuff to this point. Starting to get the picture? Okay, cool. Well, we'll stop there. Thank you. You guys are hanging in uh, like champions. Um, you've got uh, problem set three in your possession. Go through and work on that. If you have questions, get in touch with me. Happy to help out uh, there. Those will be due next Friday. Um, probably with those, the screening is probably going to be the most time-consuming piece of this. Uh, one thing I'll note as you're working with this, um, for uh, problem number three here, what I want you to do, so I'm going to say, Regress quality of life on re-experiencing. Regress quality of life on re-experiencing avoidance. Regress quality of life on re-experiencing avoidance and numbing. Regress quality of life on all four symptom clusters. What I want you to do uh, with this, I want you to don't run a hierarchical regression model. I want you to run a regression model with just one predictor, then do a different model with two predictors, one with three, and then with all four run those individually don't run those simultaneously within a regression model in the past we've had people get confused about that um, i'm going to ask you to look at your outcome and compare it to what you would expect with a hierarchical regression but run these each one of these as simultaneous regressions okay um, and as you're screening these please yeah don't do four screenings just screen these data with all four of those predictors in the outcome there okay all right. Questions on any of that? Awesome. Okay. You guys take it easy. Um, let me know if you're running into snags. Uh, t -t 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 -t. Otherwise, have fun. <laughs> awesome. Okay, folks. We'll see you.